Thank you, Admiral, for doing this. And I'd love to begin with this new book titled 2034, A Novel of the Next World War, which is currently the number, uh, number six on the New York Times bestseller list amongst many other, uh, other lists. So if I may start with my first question, Admiral, the year 2034 is not far off. Can you tell us why you chose that year for the setting of this book? Uh, well, first of all, again, thank you for having me on. Um, I think all the books I've written, and this is my uh, 10th book, but my first novel, um, all of my books look in some way into the future and, and think about what's coming. And I will tell you very honestly, Jonathan, I started, we started thinking much further into the century about how a conflict between the United States and China might uh, occur, how it might escalate, and what the results might be. And I, I have to say, and this is not uh, not uh, quieting, if you will, as, as we wrote and thought and researched, the date just kept getting closer and closer in terms of the reality. Because at the end of the day, the object of this book is a cautionary tale. People say to me sometimes, oh, Admiral, you know, you've written a book of uh, predictive fiction. No, this is a book of cautionary fiction. It's a cautionary tale because I think only by imagining our way into a war with China can we really reverse engineer it, bring it back to the present and try and avoid it. And frankly, uh, we don't have 60 years to solve mm -hmm. that problem. We have to solve it, my view, in the next 10 years, or we will stumble into a war. It, so you, you brought up a good point of your past 10 books. None of them were novels. No. Why did you approach this incredibly important and timely topic through, a, a, through the lens of a novel? A wonderful question, and I, I get it a lot, including from my 91-year-old mom. Um, three reasons. One is only in fiction can you bring characters into the story. And I would say to anybody listening this afternoon, think about your favorite book. It's almost always a novel based on a character. I love, for example, The Old Man in the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. Go figure. I'm an old man and I've spent a lot of time on the sea. But I loved it when I was 18 years old and read it for the first time. I can't tell you today exactly what happened in the plot and all the details. But boy, do I remember Santiago, the Cuban fisherman, his resilience, his uh, care and concern for his craft, his determination, the mentor, the next generation coming along. So characters can, can help carry a story, carry a message in ways that I think really resonate with readers. Number two, when you're writing nonfiction, writing that, you know, let's face it, occasionally kind of boring nonfiction, but you're kind of in a straitjacket, right? You've got to footnote everything. Everything has to be referenced. Um, you have to be factual, obviously. Um, so if you really want to splash some paint around a canvas, you know, kind of go with fiction. And then thirdly, because you can imagine more um, scenarios that are perhaps not instantly plausible and recognizable, but I think they can be, they can symbolically carry a, a particular point of view. For example, the role of India in this novel is um, painted in a way that may or may not come true in 2034, but because it's the novel, you can lay it out and it serves as a, a stalking horse for how I think India's role will unfold in this century. Plus, it was just a lot of fun to write a novel. <laughs> <laughs> and if I may say, um, speaking of the, the man that this, our center in our society is, is named after Winston Churchill, of course, he wrote one novel, Savrola, did not pan out very well. I, I must say, Admiral, your first foray into novels was certainly uh, much better received and, and, and a page turner, page turner. So that, that, that's the connection I'll make. I do want to say throughout your book, I, I noticed um, your discussion of leadership, and, and I do want to talk about that here sh here shortly. Uh, and I, I can see, and hopefully, I'll be able you'll be able to uh, uh, explain a little bit more your own type of leadership that kind of came through in some of your characters. 
uh, I note that uh, Captain Hunt discusses that when you're a commodore of a fleet, you 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 lead by delegation. But when you're the captain of a ship, you are the you're the person on the ground leading. So I'd love to know, you know, ask you a few questions about your experience as, of course, a captain, and then as a leader uh, uh, of tens of thousands of people later on. Um, if I may ask one further question about the book in terms of how you talked about this initially, how we are kind of walking into this potential crisis. Um, is there a way, you know, can you uh, elaborate on how the actions or inactions taken by past American presidential administrations have led to this conflict uh, not being, you know, outside of the realm of possibility? Well, let me, let me start by going a little further back than the last few administrations and look at a period that was so central to the life of Winston Churchill, and that was the First World War. And as most of the listeners will know, here were a group of European countries, essentially what we would think of today as constitutional monarchies, sort of nascent democracies, but those ruling families still had a great deal of actual ability to drive events. And all of those countries were intertwined economically, and they were intertwined by the blood of the royal families. Um, they were closely, closely brought together. And as a result, in the first decade of the 19th century, ex excuse me, first decade of the 20th century, 1900 to 1910, there were a series of books written that quite seriously laid out the case why there would never again be a significant war because of all of this intermarriage and the interconnectivity of all of these economies. Well, what happened? Uh, in a place called Sarajevo, an assassin's bullet kills an Austrian archduke, and the world literally sleepwalks into a war, sort of tripwires, mobilizations, and all of that integration in the end didn't matter. And the First World War killed a couple of 10, 20, 10 to 20 million Europeans. And you can drop a plumb line from the First World War to the Second World War. So all, all in, probably 50 to 80 million people killed in these two world wars. So it's an example of the fact that no matter how intertwined economies are, um, the propensity for violence keeps popping up and again and again in the human condition, notably when there is an established power who is challenged by a rising power. And of course, in World War I, it was uh, United Kingdom, established power, Kaiser's Germany, rising power. That pattern goes back 2,500 years ago to the ancient Greeks. I'm Greek American, so I know this is true. Athens and Sparta had the same dynamic. That brings us to our present moment. So the last few administrations, um, if you really go back 30 to 40 years to the Nixon administration, when we, if you will, open China to the United States, um, there's great hope. There's hope that by allowing China to operate with uh, preferential treatment in the World Trade Organization, they can lift a billion people out of poverty. Check, they did that. Uh, game plan is executing. And then the idea was China would then begin to fold itself in positive ways in the international system. That part hasn't come true. And I think if you now we're into the present moment and you look at uh, the Obama administration and the Trump administration, the light went on that we're gonna have to do something to adjust our relationship with China because of all the disagreements we have. So. I know the Biden administration is placing this at the very top of their agenda. Um, and it's gonna be very challenging, Jonathan. China claims the entire South China Sea as territorial waters. China is conducting very, very uh, aggressive human rights violations in their own country of the Uyghur population. China is pressuring many of their neighbors. China conducts unfair trade and tariff practices. China is very, much engaged in industrial level espionage and cyber warfare, um, shadowy, but very real. So for all those reasons, uh, Team Biden is um, facing a, a, a true moment in this challenge. And if we don't get a strategy together, then I am afraid over the next 10 to 15 years, 
like Europe did 100 years ago, the possibility of sleepwalking into a war is not minimal. Do you think there are four American administrations before Presidents Trump and Obama? Was there a Cold War hangover, for lack of a better term? Was there a Cold War mindset that they didn't either recognize China's growing hegemony or they didn't take it as seriously as the threat that they faced in you know, the, the second half of the 20th century. Was there, did, did that play into any sort of dynamic? I think there was a uh, Cold War euphoria. There was this sense that uh, we won and the Soviet Union is no more and America is the world's superpower, the indispensable nation. There was uh, excessive euphoria. We were spiking that ball in the end zone, to use a sports metaphor. And we really didn't see China coming. That's point one. Point two is China's rise has accelerated rapidly. And let's give them credit. They are doing extraordinary things. Um, year on year growth, um, the industrialization, the additional capability in their military, their advances in cyber, quantum, um, they are formidable. And um, we have not until I think really partly into the Trump administration, maybe a bit at the end of the Obama administration, we just were not alive to that very apparent fact. Sometimes, you know, we talk about black swans, this was a black elephant. It, we should have seen it. It was big and obvious. Um, all of that is not to say that we are, uh, in Graham Allison's words, destined for war. I don't think we are. I don't think we'll end up in a war with China. But if we want to avoid it, we have to be respectful of the rise of China, understand the challenge. And as I said before, kind of reverse our engineer our way back from the kind of events we described in uh, 2034. And so just to uh, confirm what, what you just said, and this is, so Patrick Schilling asked, is there a key reason in your mind war with China is inevitable? You say it's not inevitable. I, not at all. I think we can avoid it in the following way. Um, through constructing a strategy, engaging our allies, partners, and friends collectively, ensuring we have a strong and capable military deterrent, using economics wisely, metering the access China has to our markets, for example, um, conducting effective strategic communications, laying out our case. We need a plan that integrates all of those kinds of factors. Um, I, I give the Trump administration credit for recognizing the looming tower, but I don't think they effectively crafted a strategy that used all the elements of national power effectively. I think if we do that, um, it, in the end, it is in neither nation's interest to have a global war. And th there are, by the way, Jonathan, large pockets, issues, zones of cooperation potentially that exist. I'd put climate at the top of the list. Both yes. nations have a vital interest in solving that. I think number two, both nations have a vital interest in a functioning maritime world in which trade can flow, um, that there aren't uh, a breakdowns in the law of the sea treaty, that we apply the environmental uh, capability to deal with the health of the oceans. That's in both nations' interest. Um, thirdly, um, North Korea. You know, all roads to Pyongyang in the end lead through Beijing. And it's, again, in both nations' interest to avoid a war on the Korean Peninsula. And then fourth and finally, what are we doing these days? We're fighting a pandemic. Newsflash, there will be another pandemic. There have been pandemics about every 100 to 200 years in human history. Last truly significant one, Spanish influenza about 100 years ago at the end of World War I. So we know another one is coming. This is an area in which both nations could work together, pool resources. Let's get to the bottom of where this virus came from, how it propagated, and let's then collectively, working with China, 
apply those lessons going forward. So point being, there are multiple areas of cooperation, and this is a big difference compared to the Cold War with the U.S. and the Soviet Union, where there was almost no integration, no real uh, activity going back and forth. It was just two massive military machines, uh, nose to nose in Europe on the folded gap. Um, that's fortunately not the situation we're in, and that's part of why I don't think a war with China is inevitable. So I, I know we only have 40 minutes left. Thank you everyone for submitting questions. I will say just because I don't read out a question and there are so many, doesn't mean you're, you're excluded from, from the potential signed book. So please, please don't have that fear. Um, Admiral, I, would, I really do wanna talk about this being a leadership series. Um, I'd like to spend the next couple of minutes discussing your leadership throughout your career. And I have a few specific questions for you. The first being, Previous interviewees of this series have said that leadership is a skill to be developed and often begins in the home. I know you come from a family of service. How was leadership instilled in you at, at an early age, if it was? I was very lucky. I grew up in a military family. My father was a, a very proud uh, Marine Corps officer. And ultimately, he became a full colonel in the Marine Corps. He uh, fought in World War II. <clears throat> Uh, Korea and Vietnam. Um, and so he was just this living example of good leadership in front of me. So early on, I watched him and saw his resilience, um, saw him, you know, effectively pack his bags and get ready to deploy and go to Vietnam for 13 months. I was uh, uh, 12 years old when he deployed in the mid 60s. Um, I saw a living example in front of me of his optimism, his uh, warmth toward everyone around him. I saw his intellectual curiosity. Um, I, I caught all of that from my dad. And my mom was a wonderful leader in the home, if you will. And also from my mother, I developed a deep love of reading. So yes, I came early to leadership through observing my parents. And then the next chapter in anybody's uh, leadership journey is, is education. It's when you go to elementary school and to high school and on to college. So for me, I ended up going to the Naval Academy, which is, let's face it, places a pretty high premium on uh, talking about leadership. You're surrounded by uh, examples of great leaders like Vice Admiral James Stockdale, um, and many, many others. And then thirdly, in this early zone of development, I mentioned a moment ago, I've been a lifelong reader. Um, you can learn so much about leadership from books, from reading. And I'll tell you why. It's because books are like a simulator of leadership. You can imagine yourself in the story you're reading and you think, well, what would I do next? How would I react to that? Um, here I think of books like Gates of Fire by Stephen Pressfield about the 300 Spartans at Thermopylae. You walk in that book in the, the shoes of Leonidas, the king of the Spartans, or a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court um, in which a improbably um, in a 19th century engineer goes back a thousand years in history to the court of King Arthur. He's, a, he's an engineer, and by definition, he's the smartest person in the world, right? He knows all these advanced 19th century scientific and technical uh, facts and methodologies, but he can't convince anybody that he knows anything because he's appeared from this other point in time. It's a, it's a metaphor for the challenges of leadership in innovation. If you want a book about how leaders need to move innovative ideas, read A Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court. Um, so often these books uh, rattle into your brain when you're a teenager and they kind of stay with you. I'll mention one more. And it's a book almost everybody reads when they're in junior high school or early high school. It's To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. Go back and read that book again. 
in the environment of today's discussions of social injustice, of racism. Um, it's, it's about a, a black man unjustly accused of a rape. He's defended by a country lawyer named Atticus Finch. It's also a story about a young woman's coming of age. It's a beautifully realized novel by a, a really remarkable 20th century American writer, Harper Lee. I have a signed first edition of it here in my library that I treasure. So point being, read, read, read. And uh, here's my shameless uh, self-promotion plug. But I wrote a book about reading and leading. It's called The Leader's Bookshelf, 50 Books to Make You a Better Leader. The Leader's Bookshelf. And it's just a synopsis of 50 fiction and nonfiction books. But I firmly believe uh, leadership can be enhanced. It can be learned, not entirely, but it certainly can be improved by reading. So I'd add that to that entire package of uh, early days developing leadership style. Well, as you, um, as I said in my introduction, you held numerous um, positions throughout your, uh, uh, your career. Um, can you tell us how your leadership evolved? I mentioned in, earlier in our conversation about how Captain Hunt discusses being a Commodore versus being the captain of a ship. How did you, what did you find throughout your career of how to motivate people and lead people that changed as you yourself changed? Uh, first and foremost, I developed more humility as I went along in my career. And maybe that's counterintuitive. Maybe you feel like, uh, oh, people are gonna get more and more ego as they get more and more rank. Um, you know, it, it just didn't work that way for me. Um, I came out of the academy, you know, I'd done very well at the Naval Academy and went to a top ship. And I got to say on that waterfront as a junior officer, I was too sure of myself, too arrogant, too certain I had all the answers. Um, you know, and luckily for me, I encountered captains who showed me I didn't have all the answers. Um, I encountered chief petty officers, you know, senior enlisted who'd been around the fleet who would pull, you know, Ensign Stavridis, Lieutenant J.G. Stavridis aside and say, sir, that isn't working. Let me, let me help you understand why. Um, so the first thing I think I began to develop was more, um, more of a sense of humility. Secondly, kind of in the 10 to 15 year part of my career, um, I began to really understand the value of empathy, of listening to others. Um, and that is part of the terrain of, of increased humility. But I think by the time I got to my first command, a destroyer named the USS Barry, I had developed empathy, which simply means listening better, um, you know, kind of turn off the transmit side once in a while and just turn up the gain on the receiver. Uh, thirdly, in that tour on the Barry, I really felt the power of the peer network. Uh, and I think that's a good leadership lesson. You know, we tend to be overweight, naturally enough, um, as leaders kind of looking up the chain of command to make sure we're doing what the boss wants us to do. And I think most people pretty quickly inculcate the idea of, okay, we got to take care of the people who are working for us. I think there's generally for leaders work to be done in the peer world, the peer network, because your peers can save you in a tough position and they will be brutally honest with you. And I'll give you a practical example. When I was uh, in the Navy about uh, 16, 17 years, I became captain of a destroyer for the first time. And we were doing great. We were winning awards and we were kind of generally regarded as one of the very top ships uh, on the waterfront. Then one day we had an engineering inspection where an outside team came in. I won't drag you through all the puts and takes of this, but we flunked it. We failed it badly and we failed it so badly. We were out at sea for a part of it that the inspection team said, uh, Captain, your ship is unsafe to steam back into port. So call a tug and have yourself towed back into port. So we were towed back into port and that's pretty humiliating. And you get towed right past all the peers. 
in all of the other ships on the waterfront. They all see it. And, you know, the next day, a bunch of my fellow ship captains called me up and said, hey, Jim, you had a bad day yesterday. And I, you know, yep. And they all said, you know, what can we do to help? Uh, do you need parts? Do you need more sailors to fix whatever broke yesterday? What can we do to help? Um, peers can save you, and they can also be very honest with you. So that was sort of the middle part of my career. And then I'll close on this. By the time I got to be a senior officer, the thing I valued most, you know, if you think of humility and uh, empathy and working with your peers, taking care of your people, by the time you're a four star, hopefully you've got that down. What I found at three and four star rank at very senior roles, where now I'm commanding hundreds of thousands of people, it's innovation. It's inspiring others with new ideas. And I'll give you a practical example of that. When I got to NATO, it was pretty clear to me that the command structure was ossified. It still reflected so much of the old Cold War thinking. It was too big, too bulky, too many staffs spread all over Europe. We were fighting a war in Afghanistan. We had conflict in the Balkans. We had Libya. The war in Libya dropped in the middle of this. We had piracy. We had cyber. We had a ton of real operational challenges. Yet we had many assets and, and senior people were tied up in these big bulky staffs. We had, I don't know, 15, 17,000 people on staffs around Europe. So working with the Secretary General at the time, we redid all that. We cut it in half. We cut the staffs in half. Um, that was innovation. That was new ideas. And it's hard work. It's, you know, people don't like change. But I think by the time you're a really senior officer, um, you, you've, you've sort of done all the basics and kind of moved where you need to be. Now it's time to really think, what can I bring to the mix that's new and innovative? So that's a, a little sketch of the evolution of my uh, engagement and leadership. Thank you. And, and those are very notable lessons. Uh, and I'm sure shared by many others in, 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 their, in their own careers and lives. Um, so thank you. Uh, so I really want to get back to all of these wonderful questions and about the book, many of them, of course, about the book. Allow me to start with um, Zviad Adzenbaya. Excuse me <laughs> if I didn't pronounce that correctly, Zviad. He says, thanks, Admiral. Enjoying 2034 very much. Where do you see NATO in a future U.S.-China clash? Um, if, well, if there is one. Yeah, Zvad is uh, a good friend, a student from when I was the dean at the Fletcher School. He's now back in his home country in Georgia. And I send my warmest uh, wishes and friendship to you. Um, you know, as you saw in the novel, I don't know how far you are in the book, Zviad, um, NATO is frankly kind of off stage. Um, and this book, takes a, um, a pessimistic view of NATO going forward. I'm not sure that's accurate. Uh, maybe in the sequel to 2034, we'll see a resurgent uh, NATO. But um, here's what I hope actually happens in real life. Um, a week ago, as you probably know, I interviewed the Secretary General of NATO, uh, Jens Stoltenberg, as part of a conversation for hundreds of people uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations. And we talked a great deal about China and NATO. He is optimistic that the European allies over time will want to engage, will come, for example, on freedom of navigation patrols alongside US destroyers. The book opens up, 2034, the novel opens up with three US Navy destroyers like the beautiful Barry I commanded cutting their way through the disputed waters of the South China Sea. I would love to have written a scene where there was a German destroyer, a French destroyer, a British frigate alongside an American warship, maybe an Australian and a Japanese on either side sailing through that South China Sea. I'm hoping that's how it comes out. But again, this is a cautionary tale. And here you see in America that has not worked hard to maintain its alliances. And here, 
we're all required to quote Churchill at least twice in every conversation like this. <laughs> First quote, democracy, it's the worst form of government, excuse me, um, I'll use that quote later. The one I want for this moment is, um, there is nothing worse than uh, fighting alongside allies besides fighting without allies. Yes. Uh, Churchill knew that. I know Jonathan knows that quote well. Um, Churchill would say the United States has to work hard to maintain these alliances. So Zviad, I, I am hopeful in the real world, we'll see a vibrant NATO that stays with the United States. That's not how it turns out in the cautionary tale of 2034. Sticking with China, we have uh, Turio who writes, Admiral, I think a war with China shall occur, but with Taiwan. What is your opinion on that? I think um, a very logical flashpoint um, could well be Taiwan. Um, as most of the listeners know, the United States does not have a formal treaty alliance with, uh, with Taiwan. We, however, maintain a position of what's called strategic ambiguity, which is essentially a signal to China that um, China should abstain from using force to pull Taiwan back to the mothership, if you will. So far, that's worked reasonably well since the 1980s. Um, I think the US uh, best course of action here is not to encourage Taiwanese independence, but rather um, assist Taiwan in making its defenses as real as possible. Um, sometimes this is called the porcupine theory, the idea being that uh, lions don't eat porcupines because they're prickly, they're hard. Um, and I think the United States could help Taiwan be a porcupine without encouraging it to uh, take off for independence. But Torio, you're absolutely right. The chances of a war uh, around events in Taiwan are not insignificant. And by the way, that is part of the backstory of the book. Alan Taylor asks a question you touched on earlier, which um, I think, and I'm sure you agree, is something that um, needs to be addressed immediately and has not been in, in, a, in a strange way. He says, why is there not more of an outcry for China's genocide against the Uyghurs by the US administration, the media, uh, and other United Nations and our allies in Europe and Asia? Uh, the simple answer is because um, many nations and companies, big companies, uh, don't wanna get on the wrong side of China. So they are frankly failing to call out what by all accounts is in fact abhorrent behavior internally in China. China's reaction to this is, it's none of your business. Those are internal affairs. Um, I don't think that's acceptable. And I think um, this campaign is building steam and the United States needs to lead on this. And that's why uh, just last week on Thursday, when uh, Secretary of State Tony Blinken, good friend, uh, and Jake Sullivan, our national security advisor, these two, believe me, are the pros from Dover. They know what they're doing. Uh, they sat down with their Chinese counterparts and pushed them hard on that issue. China pushed back hard with a lengthy statement. So Secretary Blinken said, great, bring the press back and push harder. Now, I was on with Fareed Zakaria today, and you know, you'll get different views on whether that should have been done in private or in public. Um, I think as an opening statement, um, I think it was necessary uh, and a, a factually correct. And I think you're gonna see more nations over time uh, look at this. Uh, one other thing to look at in this regard is the cover story in uh, The Economist this week. Mm. Yeah, mm. I was uh, on Fareed's show with uh, Zanny DeBose, who's the editor of um, uh, the Economist, and she was quite forthright in uh, her view. And I think you're going to see more nations lean in, um, despite the cost that will come with doing so. Speaking of allies, um, and of course, I loved your Churchill quote. Um, Dennis McMahon asks, "How does China constitute a maritime security threat to U.S. interests, and can we rely on the participation by U.K. and other allied support and assets to deal with that threat?" Um, I think we can count on the UK 
um, they have been with us everywhere. Uh, I think we can count on the Australians. I think we can count on the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force because they're directly threatened by China. I think we can count on most of our Asian allies and on the rest of Europe beyond the United Kingdom. Um, I think they'll end up coming our way. And let's be honest here, of the European countries, only a very small handful have the ability to deploy capital warships at distance. So really you're talking about the UK, who I am quite confident will be with us. You're talking about the French, uh, the Germans, the Italians, the Spanish, the Dutch, and there are maybe a few others, but really it's, it's, it's half a dozen or so. Um, I think that they will come along with us. And uh, by the way, all of the ones I just mentioned uh, on, on the European flavor, UK, Germany, and France, uh, of all the European ones, those three have said that they will conduct freedom of navigation patrols. Look, this is a big deal, this uh, maritime issue, because of what China is claiming. China claims the entire South China Sea as territorial waters. You have to really stop and think about that for a minute. The South China Sea is not, you know, the Gulf of Sidra, which Libya, the, the South China Sea is the size of half of the United States of America, Mississippi to California, Canada to Mexico. That's, that's how big it is. It, it's, another one is it's the size of the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea combined. So it's a huge body of water. And if we're going to allow China to carve it out as territorial waters, uh, you can blow up the Law of the Sea Treaty. That's the end of the United Nations Law of the Sea Treaty. Why would anybody do anything at that point, other nations? People are going to start claiming big chunks of the ocean because they're full of hydrocarbons. They're full of rare yeah. earths because shipping passes over them. Um, and we're right back where we started pre-1980 before we had a United Nations Law of the Sea Treaty. So it's a big deal. And the United States is going to continue to push forward on this. These are increasingly disputed waters. And I'll conclude on this by pointing out China is building artificial islands throughout yeah. the South China Sea. And in the Navy, we don't call them artificial islands. We call them unsinkable aircraft carriers because they have airstrips, they have fighters, they have radars, they have missiles, they have tanks, they have troops, barracks. If we just lay back and let that happen, um, the international system will be grossly out of whack. And I think that would be a significant mistake. So for all those reasons, I think if the United States maintains a sensible position of confronting China here, um, I think our allies, partners, and friends will by and large come along with us. Thank you, Admiral. And I know we have uh, just about 15 minutes left and I appreciate your time in answering these questions. There are some wonderful questions. Um, I wanted to move to uh, C. Suarez who asks, and this goes towards you to, towards 2034. Uh, he says, China's ahead of the US today with AI and other fields. And I will note many other people have asked questions about uh, uh, China's technological advances currently. So he asked, why would China just 13 years from now need Iran to work out how to render the US helpless it seems that China could easily get into that point of her own. I'm not sure he, he's, he's read the book fully. Um, and you know that, that certainly, you understand why they use Iran. But talk a little bit about China's advancement in technology and, and how that's a detriment right now for mm -hmm. the United States. Yeah, uh, China's advancing very rapidly in every aspect of cybersecurity, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, and machine learning and they are accelerating. And the gap which the United States enjoyed kind of a three-year, maybe a four-year lead as recently as a decade ago, uh, I'd say that's down to a year. We're still ahead of them, I think, but no more than a year ahead and it's accelerating rapidly. We have got to up our game in terms of government-sponsored research, uh, resources flowing to science, technology, engineering, and math education. You know all the things China is doing very capably and very credibly. So we have a great deal of work here. I do want to stay on the question of why would Iran and China draw closer together? Um, you know, China's 
Uber strategy is called One Belt, One Road. And the idea of One Belt, One Road is that finished goods will flow out of China across a land route, northern route, the old Marco Polo Silk Road, and a maritime route that goes along the uh, Indian Ocean. And raw materials will come back to China. And central to that is ownership of the South China Sea. But one belt, one road has one problem. And the one problem is India. India is parked in the middle of it. So therefore, if you're China, you need two things. You need raw materials. You're gonna look north to Russia, to Siberia, a vast land mass full of all the natural resources you could want. So you're gonna draw closer to Russia. And you're looking at India as a significant geopolitical competitor. And therefore, you are going to try and build your relations with the nations around India. And that is Pakistan. But for purposes of our conversation, it's Iran. Iran's demographics are powerful. They're a very young nation, much like Pakistan, much like India. They're educationally advanced. They're on the cusp of creating a nuclear program. And uh, about a year ago, China and Iran signed uh, a $200 billion uh, deal, $200 billion from China going to Iran um, because the Iranians have coastal access on the Indian Ocean. They are a young, dynamic population, highly educated, pretty smart partner pick. Um, that's why China will move forward to have a relationship with them. Speaking on India, Meyer asks, please expand on the India's naval power. Can it be a game changer in our strategy in managing our future relationship? As a corollary, what should the U.S. be doing to get India on board? Um, this is a terrific question. And if you want, you know, geopolitics 101 in the 21st century, it, it's pretty simple. Watch my hands. Over here is the United States, Europe, Japan, Singapore, Australia, all the democracies, the techno-democracies sometimes called. Uh, over here it are authoritarian states, Russia and China. At the great power level, where is India? India is right here. They're kind of in the middle. And we better hope and we better work hard to get India to come over here and be part of this techno-democracy group. Only with India can we achieve relatively stable balance with China in particular. But this will be China, it'll be Russia, and back to the previous question, it'll be Iran. So we need to work very hard, my view, to get India over here. India has growing capability in the military. Um, in 2034, the novel, they play a very surprising role. And you know, will they be as advanced by 2034 as we postulate in the novel? Maybe they will, probably they won't, but it's symbolic. Again, back to why write fiction. You can, uh, you know, you're not in that straight jacket of precise fact. Um, here are a couple points to bear in mind on India. One is the Indian Ocean is called that for a reason. Uh, India has by far the largest coastline on it um, and they have the largest population. In fact, they'll overtake China. Um, in terms of national population by the middle of this decade. Um, so highly capable, huge access to the oceans in that Indian Ocean, it's just central to the Chinese game plan. This is why now we come to what can we do to pull India toward us? Well, uh, even as we're having this great conversation, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, his first, if you will, great power visit, India. He was just there the last couple of days stopping in Afghanistan on his way home. We need to uh, go early and often to India. This administration, I think you'll see a lot of high level visits. We need to invite the Indians back. Uh, all this is a part of um, trying to draw closer and closer with India. And, and by the way, the Trump administration tried this as well and the Obama administration kind of got started on it. So this is a bipartisan effort. It's a good one and a smart one. And then finally, we ought to try to grab uh, or build the relationship, not just with India, but with what is sometimes now called the 
quad. So the quad, not to be confused with quad, is Australia, Japan, United States, and India. And those nations are conducting exercises on uh, almost an annual basis called the Malabar exercises. They're getting more sophisticated, better and better. And I think that will be part of um, uh, pulling India towards us. Um, we need to use economics, military, strategic communication, all the things I talked about earlier, the reverse of using them to confront China, the reverse of that is um, to build them to work with India. So just one last question on the book and then I'll, I'll finish up with two questions regarding leadership. Um, sure. This is from John Miller. Given your comments and concerns about China claiming large parts of the South China Sea, and their desire to obtain natural resources, do you share the same concerns regarding Russia in the Arctic? And I should say many people have asked about Russia in the Arctic slash Alaska. Yes, I do. And this will be exacerbated by climate change. And um, here's a news flash: The ice is melting uh, on the poles and in particular on the North Pole. And don't take my word for it as a a climatologist or a scientist, because I'm not. Take my word as a mariner. I've sailed those waters. Uh, I know what is happening up there. And as the ice melts, it's going to open shipping lanes. It's going to open access to hydrocarbons. Um, it is going to create a new uh, zone of competition up there. Um, it, it'll be a, a, a thunder dome in the north. On one side of it is Russia. The other side are five NATO nations, Canada, US, uh, Denmark by virtue of Greenland, Iceland, Norway, plus two strong NATO partners, Finland and Sweden. Um, so you've got a built-in uh, set of competing interests to put it mildly. And yes, Russia will work very hard uh, to consolidate its power and influence in that region. They've already done so by moving significant military forces to the north. I promise I didn't plant this question, but Diane McCarthy asks, would you say that Churchill had an influence on your career? And if so, how? Um, absolutely. Uh, from my youngest days, I've been an enormous uh, fan of Churchill. Uh, and I, one thing I like about him is that in my view, he was a person of action you know, sort of action this day, um, dynamic, wanted to, to get out in the field himself. Um, go and read um, my early years, a roving commission about sort of the first third of his life. He just personified this idea of ride to the sound of the guns. I admire that. I admire people of action. I think in the American context, it's Theodore Roosevelt, whose bust is up there over my left shoulder. Um, but the other thing I admire about Churchill is that he was a writer. Um, he, he wrote um, all kinds of different books, memoirs, histories, his uh, marvelous books about the history of Britain, about his famous ancestor, Marlborough, all are just so immensely readable. And you know, I'm, I've, I'm poor by comparison, but I've written now 10 books. I, I think I have another eh, five, 10, who knows, in me. But um, when I get locked up as a writer, I'll pull down a copy of uh, The Second World War by Winston Churchill and just read for a couple of pages and let those phrases and that sort of King James Bible rhythm bang around in my head. So um, I, I love Churchill. He influenced me to be, I hope, someone who is willing to be forward and conduct serious operations. It, what the British would say, active service, but also to be someone who can reflect and write. Um, I think that's a, a nice package in life. And by the way, something, I, again, I admire about Teddy Roosevelt, who was not only an individual of great action, the man in the arena, but also a great writer, wrote 20 plus books himself on a wide range of topics. I don't think he wrote a novel, but we'll have to check. We'll certainly have to check. Um... The last question, this one is from JC. He says, good afternoon, Admiral. I'm a master sergeant in the Marine Corps and, and enjoying this talk. 
I agree that education is a great step to learning leadership as well and learning as a child as well as peer to peer. Can you name a few leadership books you would recommend? Thank you, sir, Semper Fidelis. Um, and I will say, of course, you wrote that book, but maybe you can pick out a few of your top 50. I can, um, and thanks for the question. And uh, again, I have the warmest regard for the Marine Corps and all of my leadership attributes began with my father, proud Colonel of Marines, George Stavridis, who's you know, marching in heaven today. Um, but I will, um, I've mentioned actually uh, several of them. Um, Old Man in the Sea is a, a marvelous book about resilience. Um, a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court is a powerful book of innovation. Um, the uh, Gates of Fire by Stephen Pressfield is an extraordinary book about uh, combat, about the, the, the rawest forms of uh, fight. And I think those are all important books of leadership. I'll give you a fourth one, and then I'll give you a nonfiction book as well. The, the fourth one is uh, The Godfather by Mario Puzo. Um, underrated book. I mean, full of, I talk about a page turner, yes. uh, but, but really full of life and leadership lessons, um, including one of my favorites, Don Corleone says at one point to his hot-headed son, Santino, don't make the mistake of hating your enemies. It clouds your judgment. That's a pretty good line for anybody. Um, nonfiction, got to, got to wrap up with a Winston Churchill book, right? So um, I'm going to reach back to what I mentioned a moment ago, my early years, a roving commission. And it, it takes Churchill from birth to his early 30s when he decided to write the book, because this is Winston Churchill at 33, I think, writes this book, a memoir of his early days, because he knew that nothing exciting would ever happen to him again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Think about all that lay ahead of him at that point. And yeah. part of the message is that um, you never know what's around the next corner. And that Churchill's life certainly personified that. Last word, Jonathan. And I, I will say, um, I noticed your Churchill influence throughout, throughout 2034. I, um, I wrote down a couple days ago, um, Bin Lao, the uh, defense attache, the Chinese defense attache, as he's jetting off after after the initial his initial mission, he he's saying how he was his entire life led up to his entire career led up to this moment. I was thinking of Churchill's famous line: um, "It was if I was walking with destiny, as if everything in life led me to this moment when he became prime minister." So uh, certainly certainly picked up on on those Churchill references. I thank you again for your time. Uh, please, if you have not done so, please purchase the book, and I will be in touch for with those who uh, who've asked the best question. Admiral Saridis, thank you uh, for your time this afternoon, and thank you for your service to our country. Thank you so much to everybody who took the time to listen on a Sunday afternoon. Thanks a lot, Jonathan. Well done. Bye bye. Take care. Thank you.